All right. So, we begin with the prayer. Master of all worlds, highest power, merciful parent of compassion, in your presence, eternal one, source of strength for us, as you have been for our ancestors. Very humbly, what are we? What are we? Our life, life, you have done such great kindness to us. to us. Therefore, we place, place our appeals before you, you that you may forgive and absolve us of all, all our faults and failings. failings. That our faults never, never become never barriers between us and you. And may it be a desire to prepare our hearts, our hearts to feel all and love for you. May you listen to these, these words, words of ours, and may you open and our, open our, our hearts. Heart the mysteries of your Torah. Of your Torah. May this our study be, be a source of pleasure before your throne of glory, glory. like the like sweet incense. May you shower down, shower down, down upon us the light of our soul source and all the, the ways by which we define ourselves. May the sparks of your holy servants for whom you have revealed these words to the world shine and sparkle. sparkle. May their merit, their, merit, their, their ancestors' merit, merit, the merit of their Torah, their innocence, their innocence and, their and their holiness stand for us, us so as to them. prevent us from stumbling when we study these words. Study these words. In their in merit, merit, may our merit, eyes be illumined by what we study, in as in the saying of the sweet singer of Israel, open my, open my eyes, eyes that I may gaze into wonders of your Torah. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. For it is the eternal grants wisdom from his mouth that knowledge and understanding issue forth. Na 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 Ananana
あなななななななあなななななななあなななあなななななななあなななあなななななあなななななななななななななななななななななななななななななななななななななななな Age three one seven, three hundred and seventeen. In、uh, our edition of Zohar, and、uh, who knows? Maybe we'll、uh, we'll get to the very end of this Torah portion tonight. It's possible.、Um, As long as nobody says anything, <laughs> including me,、uh, so、uh, we'll see. We were in the middle of this long paragraph in the in the middle of the page on third three one seven, and the point of this paragraph is that when we see how many times Jacob received the blessing, we come up with four different moments of blessing. Two of those moments. Are given、uh, are are times when Isaac gives a blessing to Jacob. The first one is the famous、uh, scene, and then the second blessing, second time that Isaac gives a blessing to Jacob is when、uh, he's about to to leave home, and this is done yeah, as a as again as a an affirmation of the blessing with Isaac's full consciousness of of、uh, of giving the blessing, and then we have. God blessing、um, Jacob, and we have this mysterious wrestler, who is apparently Samael, Sarosha Esav, the prince of 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 Esav,、um, also reconfirming、um, the blessing. So we have、uh, um, we have these four, and what the Zohar says is that in confronting.、Um, In the you know preparing for the wrestling match,、um, Jacob only uses one of the blessings. He already actually has has a bunch of them, and、uh, he says this is enough. I'll be able to、uh, you know prevail with the the blessing, the 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 secondary kind of blessing that I receive from my father, and and the main blessing, which is this blessing of total you know、uh, totally prevailing. Redemption,、uh, and so on. He reserves for later, and he reserves when he won't use it, but he hopes that his children will be able to use it. So、uh, when they will need it, and they'll need it to survive all of the vicissitudes of Jewish history, eventually they'll be able to to avail themselves of all these other blessings, and finally the the final blessing of of redemption. So、um, let's uh, um, just to get to this uh, uh, to, to this point one more time. Um, um, let's start in the middle of of、um, of the paragraph.、Um, at the end of the line, there's a footnote number four thirty six. Everybody can find that. So let's start with that next line. Jacob said, "Okay,、um, okay, is that、uh, okay?" And Beryl's got it. Go. Well, I will as soon as I find it. Jacob、uh, said, "Now I will take this one and use it, reserving 
all those others for when I and my children after me will need them. When is that? When all nations gather to annihilate my children from the world. As is written, all nations surrounded me. By the name of yud heh vav -Hey, I will surely cut them down. They surrounded me on every side. By the name of yud heh vav -Hey, I will surely cut them down. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished like burning thorns. By the name of yud heh vav -Hey, I will surely cut them down. Look, here are three. So here are three. If you look at that series of verses, this is all something that we recite in the Hallel. Um, that Sabuni, Gam Svavuni, Bishem Hashem Kim Elam, Sabuni, Hidvorim, of Sabuni, Sabuni, Sabuni. They encircled me, they surrounded me. Um, this is three times. What's that all about? The corresponding. Corresponding to the three remaining ones. One, the first blessing of his father. Two, the blessings bestowed upon him by the blessed Holy One. Three, the blessings offered by, offered him by that angel, Jacob said. There, they will be needed against all the peoples, nations, and tongues of the entire world. So I will reserve them for then. While now against Asa, this is enough. And it was enough. Um... So we've talked about this a little bit. I want to just uh, um, make a little bit of a connection to the previous uh, um, discussion. So Jacob is, uh, in a spiritual sense, he's doing what the Torah describes him doing um, practically with regard to uh, his family as they get ready for Asav's arrival, right? He does these, these, these different kinds of uh, um, tactics to try to preserve somebody. You know, he splits up his camp into two camps. If one camp will be attacked, the other camp will be able to escape. And then later on, um, he will set up his, his family members um, in, in a kind of an order of priority so that he preserves Rachel and uh, her children for the end. So he is looking out for his family and trying in some way or other to protect his family from, uh, from danger. And here now he's, according to the Zohar, he is reserving his main resources, right? The, 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 the heavy duty blessings he's reserving for later for the sake of posterity, for the sake of his children, when the children will be uh, besieged and, and, and oppressed and attacked again and again and again, um, they, they will have, uh, they'll be able to avail themselves of, of uh, these, these, uh, um, these blessings. I'm sorry. Hold on one second, please. So um, this is for the sake of, of, of uh, the future, for the sake of the children. We talked, um, was it last time or whenever, um, what was, we said, what was actually the, uh, uh, the thigh, the vulnerable part of uh, Jacob that was uh, open to attack, uh, that, the, that the, uh, the satanic angel uh, in desperation, um, went for because he saw that overall Jacob was completely impregnable, right? Uh, that's an interesting word to use in this context. So uh, um, he saw that he couldn't he couldn't get at Jacob. Jacob was invincible, and yet finally he figures it out. Okay, the thigh. And what did we say? We said that the thigh is this um, uh, reference to 
the generative capacity and to the idea of, pro of producing children and the uh, iffiness of that reality um, what's going to be actually, you know, the, the, the children that, that uh, come after us, uh, do they preserve what we, what we do? Do they build on what we do? Do they wreck what we do? These are, these are uh, um, you know, Im impossible to know. And in that sense, there's a vulnerability. So here what we have is the Zohar saying that uh, Jacob is storing up blessings for the children. Right? Now, whether the children themselves will avail themselves of the blessings or whether they'll squander the blessings, that he has no control over. But, uh, but he's, he's saving the blessings for us, right? For us. Um, okay. We'll see that this comes out a little bit more as, we'll, as, uh, as we go along. Okay. Um, we're at the, la the bottom part of uh, 317, the last two, two lines. This can be compared to a king who had many powerful legions, countless tested warriors to wage battles, poised to attack mighty kings. Meanwhile, he heard about a ravaging robber. He said, let these gatekeepers go there. They asked him, of all your legions, are you only sending these? He replied, to deal with that robber, these will suffice, since I am keeping all my legions and warriors in reserve for when I need to confront those powerful kings on the day of battle. Similarly, Jacob said, to deal with Asav, these blessings will suffice for now, while the rest I will reserve for when my children need them to confront all the kings and rulers of the entire world. When that time arrives, those blessings will rouse in every direction and the world will be established firmly, fittingly. From that day on, this kingdom will dominate all other kingdoms as has been established for it is written, it will crush and consume all these kingdoms and will itself endure forever. Namely, that rock hewn from the mountain, not by hands. As is said, from there the shepherd, rock of Israel, who is the rock? Assembly of Israel, as is said, and this rock that I set up as a pillar will be a house of God. Okay. So a lot in this paragraph, the the uh, compare the the uh, parable is pretty clear, right? The king has uh, bigger uh, issues to that he's uh, worried about for later. So a little petty robber he'll take care of with uh, you know a small force of of gatekeepers, not the not the crack troops that he has trained for real battle. When the real battle comes, then he's gonna, why should he waste uh, his real soldiers on that? On that? He'll, when the real battle comes, he'll use them. So the same thing over here, As uh, Jacob says, Asav, I can, I can deal with Asav, it's, you know, with, with, with one bracha, but the other brachot I'm gonna need for the real severe testing. Um, when that time arrives, those blessings will rouse in every direction and the world will be established firmly, fittingly, from that day on, this kingdom will dominate all other kingdoms. So as the note says, what we have here is the end of days. We have here the vision of the ultimate redemption. When the Mashiach comes, then Mashiach will be able to set the world uh, on its proper path and subdue all evil, subdue any uh, violence and danger and attacks and, uh, and be able to uh, establish you know, a, a world peace, right? So all these kingdoms that are going to be attacking, that are going to be uh, uh, trying to cause trouble, they will be crushed and consumed. But the, uh, uh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Mashiach, established by the Mashiach, will endure forever. Okay, and what is that? That rock hewn from the mountain, not by hands. So look at note 440. Rock hewn from mountain, not by hands. 
see the following verse where the prophet speaks to King Nebuchadnezzar, just as you saw that a stone was hewn from the mountain, not by hands, and that it was crushed. And that it crushed. Crushed the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. Right, so this is not a man-made force. This is God creating um, uh, that, that, that dream uh, image of the rock um, and and uh, that's going to uh, uh, destroy um, the, the metals. And of course, that means that the Mashiach will destroy all of the other kingdoms. So this is part of the imagery that, that, that's found in, in Daniel. Um, a rock that's not made by human hands. Do we know of any other rocks that are not made by human hands? Craig? Two tablets. That's right, right? The first two tablets. Um, that uh, are given to us at Mount Sinai are produced by God. It's only afterwards that, you know, when Moses smashes them because of the golden calf situation, that we uh, are then said, okay, you know what? You do it. Right? You make the, the stone tablets. And then I'll write the words, says God. But you have to, you have to do the tablets. So... Um, here we have a similar idea of this is like completely heavenly based, heavenly sourced. This is the pure uh, goodness that will come down and finally prevail. And that rock, uh, what is it, right? Hisham Evan Yisrael, what is Evan Yisrael? What is the rock of Israel? Um, the word there is Evan, not Sur. Uh, we use the word tzur other places. Tzur Yisrael, kuma biezat Yisrael. So tzur can mean a rock, but it also it probably means more of like a, a, a whole promontory, a rocky kind of mountain. While an even, even means a rock. You know, a, uh, a, a, a rock that, that, you, that can be, you know, pushed from one place to another. So um, who is the rock of Israel? Assembly of Israel. And assembly of Israel means? Yes, even on, even on mute, I could hear you. Yeah, Shechina. Right, Shechina. Right, the assembly, Knesset Yisrael, the bringing together, the assembling uh, of Israel is, uh, is, is the rock of Israel as well. That's the steadfast um, rock, you know, prudential, right? You know, just what you can, what you can depend on. And of course, Israel is Israel, right? The, the assembly of Israel is the collecting of all that Israel uh, pours in uh, to uh, Shekhinah. That's the Kutcha Brichu. And that's uh, Jacob as well. In a certain sense, what Shekhinah is doing here is also assembling, collecting, receiving the blessings that were given. She's actually one of the ones that gave blessings to Jacob. And now Jacob puts them back and deposits them back into Shekhinah so that Shekhinah will be able to uh, um, take care of, of uh, establishing um, the Messianic age. The last verse that is cited comes from what episode? Comes from, from Jacob's ladder. When Jacob... Um, lies down and, and he puts um, a rock under his head and then he dreams of Jacob's ladder and then in the morning he says whoa I never realized that this is that God is in this place and he takes the rock and he sets it up to be um, uh, a, uh, a pillar and a, and a monument as, as, as uh, the house of God right one second. Okay. Any comments? Anything else to say here? All right. We'll continue. Hello. Um, so now we're coming uh, to Rabbi Chia. So Rabbi Chia says, here's another uh, verse um, or source of verses which uh, allude to the same uh, point. 
Rabbi Hia said. From 318 toward the bottom of the page. Go ahead. Was in the right place? Yeah. Hmm. Rabbi Hia said, from here, a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob, the other, remaining blessings. Similarly, it is written, the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, among all the nations, not just Asa, like do from yud heh vav -Hey. All right, so, so the, the verse that he quotes is a verse from Isaiah. And uh, just to quickly take a look at it. Um, So it says like this, on that day, lo Yosef od, uh, I need the light here. Lo Yosef od she'ar Yisraelu fleitat beit Yaakov li'sha'in al makehu v'nish'an al Hashem v'dosh Yisrael be'emet. Right, on that day, that final day of reckoning, so the she'ar Yisrael, the rest of Israel, right? The, there's a, uh, the, the, you know, whoever's left, Pleitat Beit Yaakov, whoever has been able to escape from the house of Jacob, from all of the destruction and all of the trials and tribulations throughout history, they will no longer have to lean on their oppressor, right? On the one that is smiting them, right? In, in, in the, the, the situation of the powerless is, that they're being, they're being smitten, they're being, they're being, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, afflicted, and yet the only power that they can uh, uh, avail themselves of is the is the power of the oppressor. So they have to somehow figure out how can I, how can I depend on my oppressor? What what compromises? What survival strategies? What deals can I cut with my oppressor? Right, because that's that's the only game in town. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. Bayom Ahu and that day, Inishan al Hashem Kedosh Yisrael beEmet. On that day, they will depend only on the Eternal One, who is the holiness of Israel, in truth. Right? No more subterfuges. No more games. No more uh, whatever um, uh, shrewdnesses and circuity, uh, circuitous stuff. We've talked about that many times, uh, right? Um, and the next verse, just to um, uh, drive it home, Sha'ar Yashuv, Sha'ar Yaakov, El El Gibor, right? The, the whatever is left over will return. Whatever is left over from Jacob will return to the mighty God. So um, this is this is the uh, uh, the vision, and clearly, the remnant, the the the, the surviving little group of of, uh, of uh, the house of Jacob, um, in the simple meaning, refers to whoever are the Jewish people that are still around at that time. That's not what the Zohar says. What does the Zohar say? generations no, no it's, it's it's the blessings it's not the, the people. leftovers are not the people the people who survive it's the surviving blessings the leftover blessings will come to be able to finally uh, uh you know depend on god and be able to be put into action and into operation and then we have the verse from micha and the verse from micha says like this. You have the translation actually. Um, look at the English translation. You have it there. Um, 444. Carol, you got it? Okay. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations like do. The verses read, the remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples like do from yud heh vav -Hey. The remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, 
in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among animals of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep, which tramples and tears as it goes with no one to deliver. Okay, so, and then the, the last thing, see the reference to do, etc. See the reference to do in Isaac's first blessing to Jacob. Right, so that, that's okay. So that first blessing, of course, is held in reserve. So now what Rabbi Chia is saying is, aha, and this is what's going to finally be brought to bear um, at the end of days. The Hebrew reads us like this, and we have a dot, dot, dot in the, in the note. It says, V'hayash she'irit Yaakov of amim rabim. And the remnant of Jacob will be within the midst of many peoples, ketal me'et Hashem, like the dew coming from God, from the eternal. Kirivivim alei esev, like the rain on the, on the grass, asher lo ish, which, and here the, there could be many different kinds of translations, which does not depend on any human being. Remember, just like that stone is not made by God, the dew doesn't, doesn't get engendered by, uh, by, it doesn't get created by God. Velo yiachel livnei adam. And does not uh, um, seek to, uh, to wait for or hope in any human beings. Vehayash she'irit Yaakov ba'goyim v'kerav amim rabim. And the remnant of Jacob will be in the nations, in the peoples, in the midst of many peoples. Uh, right, as a lion among the the forest uh, uh, um, animals. Um, here, uh, yes, the animals of the forest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the rest of the translation is there. And then finally, it says, "Veramas v'taraf ve'ein matzil," and it will. Um, uh, trample and it will uh, tear apart um, uh, without anybody to be able to save, um, to save uh, the, the prey, to save the victim. So we have two uh, different um, images that are, are uh, given to the, to the remnant of Jacob. One is the image of do, right? That's the one that's directly quoted by Rabbi Chia, but Rabbi Chia knows that we all know Tanakh by heart, so we know all the rest of the verses. And the follow-up verse says, another image for the remnant of Jacob is like a lion, right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So very, very different uh, images, no? What do we make of that? What is, what is the, the prophet, what is, what is Micha trying to say here? I mean, the, 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 the idea of, of do is very peaceful. It's, it's uh, you know, sound. It's life, it's life giving. And it's life giving. We have um, not just Isaac's blessing to, uh, um, to, J to Jacob, right? That may God give you from the dew of heaven, but also we have at the very end of the, of the Torah, right? Hazino Vadabira. Moses says, at, you know, on his deathbed, says, you know, listen up, give ear, heaven and earth. Yarov kamatar tizal katal imrati. May my words be like refreshing rain and like the dew uh, um, that that the, that the trickles down. So these are positive images of, like you say, life enhancing, nourishing um, elements. And then you get this other image of the lion devouring its prey, tearing things apart. Nobody can stop the lion from from uh, just you know shredding um, uh, the 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 animals that that it that it attacks. Um, so it's like, it's like night and day, right? Very, very opposite kinds of images. Both of them attributed to um, Sheirit Yaakov, to the remnant of Jacob. So what do we make of that? The Pusuk seems to uh, <clears throat> refer to the lion being in the midst 
midst of and the do being in the midst of. Yeah, they're both in relation to all these other peoples, right? The, the remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of all these peoples like do, like a ravaging lion. So, I mean, that's, it's a little contradictory, no, or what? Well, we've seen elsewhere that Shechina can be the saver and the punisher. Right. So some people read it as, as, as a strict line of nobody can touch the do, nobody can control the do. Um, so we're going to be untouchable. But on the other hand, we will also be unstoppable. And we will wreak vengeance upon any of the terrible evil uh, peoples that are out there. That's the way some uh, readers uh, see the, those verses. But others say a little bit more of a balanced picture like what David was saying. It depends. It depends which nations we're talking about. It depends which uh, kind of relationship we have with those peoples. The peoples that want to destroy us, they will be, what's the cat's name? Daisy. Hello, Daisy. She Hello. loves she loves your classes and she also attends on Saturday morning. Very good. I finally figured out who my, my real audience is. At it. She's a mystic cat. Yeah. All right. Um so um it depends on which kinds of peoples we're talking about. Same way we had earlier that um uh the uh um the uh, Mashiach will crush and consume all those kingdoms. Those are the kingdoms that are the antagonists. Those are the kingdoms that are trying to hold back the messianic order. Um, but what if there are peoples that see the light? What if they finally accept the truth? Then we can be like Tal. Then we can be like refreshing, life-giving dew. Right? So it, it all depends on um, the dynamic between us and which peoples we're, we're being uh, um, in the midst of. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the end of days. And these blessings, according to Rabbi Chia, these blessings will be either real blessings for those who want to share in the blessings, Right? And that's what he says here as well. This is not, we have not just East Esav, right? But the, by, but the other side of it is not just Jacob. The remaining blessings of Jacob will eventually then spread out to whoever it is that's willing to, uh, uh, to, to take on those blessings. And those that are against the blessings will be crushed. Okay, so that's the, that's the first side of it. Okay. Rabbi Yesa. Rabbi Yesa opened, a son honors his father and a servant his master. A son, Asa, for no one in the world ever honored his father as much as Asa honored his. And the honor he rendered to him granted him dominion in this world. And a servant, his master, Eliezer, Abraham's servant, as they had established. For here was a person who came to Haran with so much wealth, so many presents and gifts, loaded camels. Yet he didn't claim to Bethuel and Laban that he was an intimate friend of Abraham or someone coming at Abraham's request. Rather, even before he spoke his words, what is written? He said, I am Abraham's servant. And subsequently, my master, my master, in order to honor Abraham. That honor and graciousness prolonged his life enduringly. So let's read 449 just for a second. Subsequently, my master, my master. Eliezer employs his, this formula 14 times in this chapter. 
Okay, so this is the story of the uh, uh, the unnamed servant, but now the Zohar says our tradition keeps on identifying that servant with Eliezer. Eliezer is the one who goes to find um, a, uh, a wife for Isaac. And uh, um, we say here that uh, it's so wonderful when a son honors their father and when a servant honors their master. So before we, we'll go back to Esau in a minute, but here we have Eliezer, Abraham's servant, and the Zohar goes, look at how he honors his master and honors and acknowledges the mastery of his master, right? The status of master that his Abraham has with regard, because he, he could have fudged it. He could have fudged it. He looked like a very, very prominent person. He could have discharged his mission. He didn't have to say, I'm Abraham's. He could have said, you know, I'm Abraham's best friend. I'm his neighbor. Um, and I'm here to, uh, uh, on his behalf. And, uh, you know, he could have used Abraham's grandeur, Abraham's wealth to reflect back on him. And he could have uh, uh, made himself look really good and, uh, and important. And nevertheless, and they wouldn't know the difference. They wouldn't have any idea what, what was, uh, you know, his Eliezer's true standing. And yet Eliezer took as his calling card, as the way that he should introduce himself, you know what's really special about me? I'm Abraham's servant. Um, and, and then every time he talks about Abraham again and again and again, uh, twice seven times, he says, my, my master, Adoni, Adoni, my master. So this is a person who is reveling in his being the, uh, um, the servant of Abraham. We have uh, on Shabbat, uh, we have a piece of Zohar that we say uh, in front of the ark when we take the when we open the ark to take the Torah out, and we say, "Ana avda the kudusha berichu." I am the slave, the servant of the Holy Blessed One. The sagidna kamei, the kamei the karo the karo raitei b'choli dan vidan, and I bow down before God's honor and before the honor of God's Torah all the time. So this is being exemplified here by, by, um, by Eliezer. Um, we have uh, in, in this coming uh, Shabbat, the Torah reading that's scheduled is when we finally get freed from slavery and we get out, right? And uh, that's the, why are we getting out? So that we can become God's slaves. So that we shouldn't be slaves God says, you are uh, supposed to be my slaves and not anybody else's slaves. That's your uh, yichas. That's your uh, real status. That's what makes you a VIP, that you're nobody else's slave but mine. Um, so here Eliezer is that kind of slave servant honoring his master and accepting and, and, and celebrating the fact that this is my master. This is the person who is my master. So that's the, uh, the, the greatness of Eliezer and that honor and graciousness prolonged his life enduringly. So what was the reward? The reward was that Eliezer was given exceedingly long life. Here we get into some interesting midrashim um, that go one way or another. Look at 450. That honor and graciousness prolonged his life enduringly. According to rabbinic tradition, Eliezer was none other than Og, king of Bashan, who lived to the age of 500. And then you have all those citations. Right, so Og Melech Habashan, he ended up actually coming into his own uh, power and he outlived Abraham and he outlived uh, Isaac and he act outlived Jacob. And he becomes one of the kings um, who encounters the Israelites on their way through the wilderness. So on the one hand, he's rewarded with great longevity. 
right? He just outlives everybody. And he gets to be a king. Um, on the other hand, he gets to be defeated by the Israelites. So that's not so, so good for him. Um, so there's a little bit of a, of a you know, a, a kind of an irony in thinking that that's his reward. Um, so therefore, there's another tradition. We read that. To another tradition, Eliezer entered paradise during his lifetime. See the rest of it. Okay, so that's a little bit more, you know, easy going, straightforward. That. Uh, um, that's straightforward. That, of course, that's a wonderful reward that uh, that you get to go into paradise without any uh, um, sickness, the pain of death, and so on and so forth. He's like just rewarded as being okay, good. Here you go, you're invited into into paradise. Come on up. Um, so that's what I mean by straightforward. Is that's saying the guy is a good a good guy. He gets a good reward. The first one is a little more mixed. Right, um, and I I would suggest, you know, it, it's part of a long, distinguished thread within our tradition of ambivalence and mistrust of even the good goyim. Right, that uh, um, maybe he was, uh, you know, uh, good to us at this particular point, but don't bank on him being good all the time. Don't, uh, don't expect that he will be enduringly uh, wonderful. Um, he, you know, this, the, this wonderful Eliezer ends up actually becoming an enemy um, and it becomes Og Melech Habashan. All of the, the reward that he was given, in the end, he uses it um, in an unfortunate way. So that's, you know, that's part of our tradition. It's part, that's part of the way people have looked at things with a kind of a more jaundiced eye. Um, that jaundiced eye, if it has anything to teach us, um, is uh, that you know none of us are exempt from being looked at with a jaundiced eye. And we have to watch out our, ourselves with what we do with our blessings and, and how we, um, you know, how we uh, uh, live out our own, our own visions and our own ambitions. Um, Let's go back now to Esav. Um, so Rabbi Esav starts the verse with Ben Yechabedav, that a son uh, will honor, uh, tends to honor, honors their father. Okay, and he says, what, what Ben is the verse talking about? And he says that Ben, who is the most exemplary Ben, the most exemplary son that you can imagine? So here we have, uh, you know, a, a different kind of uh, um, uh, approach. Um, I, you know, I, no one would be surprised if Isaac was the uh, was the was the chosen one as the as the son, right? Isaac went with his father up to Mount Moriah. Um, you know, he asks him what's going on. He complies with everything that his father wants him to do. What a, what a wonderful son. Um, and yet that's not what Rabbi Asa says. What Rabbi Asa says is, no, the most exemplary son that we can look at is Esav. I want to look for a second. Larry wrote something here. Eliezer and Esav are Gentiles who pay obeisance to Jews. Eliezer to Abraham and Esav to Yitzchak. Yes, this is to their merit. But the merit of the Gentiles defers or delays the blessings of the Jews. Okay, interesting point. Yes, anybody want to follow up on that? Why is Esau a Gentile? Because Esau is not the one who is included in the family. Esau becomes a separate people. Esau is not one of the tribes of Israel. Just like Ishmael is not one of the line that is called the seed of Abraham. Right, the story of the Jewish people using that term as an anachronism, but nevertheless, this, 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 the Jewish people's line starts from Abraham, goes to Isaac, not to Ishmael, and from Isaac to Jacob, and not to Esau. Well, but with Ishmael, there's a reason because he has a, a non-Jewish mother. 
his mother is not one of the, one of the matriarchs, but Esau is born of Isaac and Rebekah. Correct, and yet he's thrown out. So you can be thrown out of being Jewish? At that point when it's being established, when the line is being established, that's what happens. There's a sifting, there's a sorting out. That's exactly what the whole book of Genesis is all about. I mean, and look, historically, there's nothing to talk about. Esau is Esau. Esau is not. Esau has 12 tribes of his own. Esau has his own country. Esau has his own uh, um, identity. Esau walks away. Esau marries, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the people that, uh, that Rebecca and Isaac don't want him to marry in order to set up his own family. He doesn't abide by the parameters set up by the by the the clan. Yeah. But doesn't Eliezer have a Jewish has a Hebrew name? Eliezer that, has attesting to the Hebrew God. So what? Malkitzedek is a Hebrew name too. Most names in the in in, in Torah happen to be Hebrew. You know who doesn't have a Hebrew name? Moshe. <laughs> so having a Hebrew name doesn't do anything. Um, what can I say? Um, but his Hebrew name attests to the divinity. Correct. Yeah, but he's, but he's still not one of us. He's not Fununzara, right? I mean, and, you know, to a certain extent, you know, I'm pushing this biblical uh, um, line. But of course, we're talking about this post, post facto. We're talking about this after history has, has worked itself out. But the Torah is very uh, um, aware of that. That's, a, that's its whole point of ending um, the Parsha with, with, uh, with Esau proliferating and, and becoming successful and, and, and so on and so forth back in, in uh, Vayishlach. Because that's the, exactly the idea. The, the, the paths you know, diverge. They don't, they, don't, uh, they don't continue on the same line. So the, the point that Larry is bringing up is on the one hand, we have great um, uh, admiration for what uh, these two figures represent. With Eliezer, it's, it's a little trickier, you know, whether Eliezer, that, that could be part of the Og part, you know, that Eliezer in the end comes out to be an adversary of, of uh, of the Jewish people, but certainly when, when Eliezer's reward could be very much seen as not at anybody else's expense, right? He goes into Gan Eden by himself. That doesn't hurt us. It doesn't hurt us. It doesn't hurt anybody else. It's good. You know, the more the merrier. But uh, um, Esau is, of course, Esau, as we have been saying endlessly for months. Um, so here we have this um, you know, paradoxical uh, um, recognition. Um, and again, only one thread that of, of the rabbinic tradition, but this is celebrating Esau as an amazing son. This son, he was absolutely super terrific to his father, Isaac. We've had other already discussions that don't believe that such a thing is possible, that everything that he did for his father was, was dishonest, that it was all phony, that it was all with, a, with an agenda. You know, Esau is bad from the get-go, just say the word and everything that you're gonna see about Esau, you're gonna see it through that, that dark you know, uh, lens and, and condemn him for everything. He kisses his brother when he meets him, Ah, oh, you know why he was why he kissed him? Because he wanted to kill him. Um, you know, all you know, anything good that he does will not be good. If you're convinced that he's rotten to the core, he's essentially evil. It's very hard to then credit him with anything good. Um, not impossible, but it's very hard. Um, what and what Rabbi Yesa is saying here is, and he's again part of a long line of rabbinic midrash. In the, in the note 445, you've got all kinds of midrashic citations that back this up. 
what he's saying is, you know what? We have to give Asa credit. He deserves certain credit. He deserves credit that he really was a devoted son who took care of his father. Um, this is um, a, a uh, something that happens interestingly in there's a there's a, a key uh, section. Um, of a few pages in the Gemara and in the Talmud in, in Masechet Kiddushin that is devoted to the mitzvah of Kibbut Avayim. And there are wonderful stories there and discussions. It's a, it's a great text to, to, to study. And one of the uh, uh, stories that they uh, uh, tell in there is that the rabbi said, you want to know how, to what extent you should be knocking yourself out to, be, to, to, to honor your parents. You know who the most exemplary person is that we know of who honored his father? Doma ben Nesina, a non-Jew. So it's a non-Jew and the story that they tell, it's, it's told in a number of versions. One story is that he, uh, his father had, uh, um, had, uh, uh, Jewels. You know, he was he was a, a dealer in jewels, and he had precious jewels. And um, Jewish representatives came to him, and they needed the jewels for the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol of the high priest. So uh, um, he had the best stuff, and the only certain jewels can be used for each of the of the sockets. And he was he was he was uh, you know price. You know, money was no object. He was, this was going to be an amazing deal. So they come and they knock on his door and his son, Dama ben Natina, Natina's uh, son, uh, Dama, comes to the door and they tell him that this is what they're here for to, to close this deal. And he says, I'm sorry, my father is taking his afternoon nap and, and I can't wake up my father. He, he's, you know, he's entitled to have his nap and I don't bother him. He doesn't get bothered at this moment. You can't bother him. So as a result, they lost the deal. Um, and, uh, you know, millions and millions of dollars were, were, were they went to somebody else. They needed, the, they needed to, to, do the, uh, to do the deal. So the Gemara says that what was the reward for Dhamma Ben Natina? Uh, for being so devoted and so respectful of his father that later on his father had a red heifer and the Jews came to his house because they needed the red heifer for the temple because this was what they needed to in order to uh, uh, purify people uh, from their ritual impurity from coming in, in contact with death. And of course they paid through the nose and they and they and as a result, uh, Dama ben Atina and his father made millions more than they would have made from the other deal. And the reason that the God gave them that uh, red heifer was to was to reward Dama ben Atina for being such a good son. And then they tell other stories about him being respectful to his mother. So the Gemara, in the end, actually makes this whole point of if if you want to uh, um, fulfill you know, one of the, you know, one of the big 10, one of the 10 commandments, honor your father and mother, look to the Goyim. The Goyim know how to do it. They didn't have to stand at Mount Sinai. They didn't have to hear God call down from heaven that this is a mitzvah. They get it. They get it simply because of that, of their natural sense of what's right and wrong and their loyalty to their parents. So there's a, there's a really, uh, you know, quiet but very very strong you know dig at uh, at, uh, at 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 Jews and at Jewish tradition by the rabbis going you know what we actually needed God at Mount Sinai to tell us to be good to our parents um, the Goyim know it automatically so and we have it from Mount Sinai and what good do we do so here's a sub and it's precisely because he's Asav that it's so powerful to say that he's the guy who's the exemplary good son. He is the good son. So 
Nobody else honored him as much. So if you look at the note, look at 445, please. Go ahead. I will soon. 445, where are you? It's not five, you're 318, you got it? A son, Asav. A son honors his father. Asav, who honored his father greatly, going out to the fields, hunting game, bringing it back, yeah. cooking it, bringing it back to his father and feeding him every day. Right. So this is, here's a man who endangers his life every day just to be able to personally deal with taking care of his father and, and he doesn't give it to the servants. What do you think? Isaac and, and, and didn't have a, he was a rich man, Isaac. He had a whole elaborate uh, uh, encampment. Somebody else couldn't cook his meals? No, Asaph wanted to do it personally to help his father. Um, uh, there's another place where one of the sages goes, I, I, I knock myself out to honor my, my father. And what I do is nothing compared to what Asaph did. When I try to take care of my father, I feed him, but you know what? When I'm in the house, I wear a shmata. You know, like, uh, you know, I only, if I'm on Zoom, I don't, you know, nobody can see the, 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 the dirty pair of pants that I'm wearing. I don't have to get dressed up. When I'm home, I'm wearing a shmata. And then when I go out, I put on a, a good suit and I, Ace of, when he fed his father, that's when he got dressed up in his best suit because that's part of the plot. Remember when uh, Jacob is able to, to go in to meet Isaac, he puts on Esau's clothes, the best clothes, big day Esau v'achamudot, the most precious clothes. Why? Because Esau fed his father dressed to the nines. He treated his father as if his father was a king. And Esau, um, is 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 that kind of special man? We 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 come up. We don't come up to his, you know, to to his uh, um, shoelaces. Is what one of the rabbis says. So there is this whole strong tradition that Asav um, was terrific, you know, uh, in 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 dealing with his father. So I want to bring back uh, the 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 theme that we had a little earlier tonight and also last week. This is the thigh issue, right? This is the same idea of the, the, the ramifications, the next generation, the mystery, the unpredictability, the, the, the you know, the, the, the loose uh, canon quality of the thigh, right? That the thigh is, 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 is subject to this kind of unexpected uh, attack one way or the other, right? We don't, there's no guarantee that uh, righteous people will have righteous children. There's no guarantee that uh, um, a person who is uh, a miserable SOB will not have some kind of special quality of righteousness um, in let's say particularly a, a, a family situation. Um, you know, it's a kind of a classic uh, thing. I think I mentioned it earlier, way back. There's some uh, famous James Cagney uh, movie where the guy James Cagney plays this 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 uh, mobster, gangster, you know, terrible person, except that he loves his mom. Right. That's and I, I forgot. Craig, you remember the name of the movie? White Heat. White Heat. Thank you. So, um, and that's in the end his downfall, right? Um, which is, you know, that's part of the paradox. So he's got this thing, and again, to take a, you know, make a simplified uh, superficial uh, generalization, family, let's say in the mafia, is huge, is Kodesh Kodashim, right? Is the Holy of Holies, right? So it's, there's no problem, you know, murdering people right and left. But you know, mom and dad are uh, are sacred. 
So there's this weird kind of, uh, um, you know, dynamic that can that can develop um, out of the the generative reality that we that we create another generation, another life that we can't control, and is completely unpredictable. And here is this idea of here's Asav, the the essence of evil, and nevertheless he has this extreme sense of of uh, taking care of his father, which is a mitzvah, which is a, which is a great mitzvah, and that in the end is what the what the Zohar says to come back to Larry's point. That in the end is what gives him purchase in this world. This is what allows him to continue to be the, uh, um, the ruler of this world until the end of days when Jacob's blessings will finally come about. Let's read the last paragraph um, of this uh, on, on 319, which is, as you might be able to see from the printing, this is the last paragraph of the Zohar on Toldot. So we're having like a, a mini seum tonight. Okay, Beryl, it's all yours. With Asav, the honor he rendered his father prolonged his dominion so persistently in this world. While those tears prolonged Israel's subjugation to him. Until Israel returns to the blessed Holy One with weeping and tears. As is written, with weeping they will come, with supplications I will conduct them. Then saviors will climb Mount Zion to execute judgment on Mount Esau, and dominion will be Yudhevapes. The tears, as we learned earlier, that's when Esau bursts into crying to say to, ya, to, say to uh, 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 Yitzchak, to his father, what, you don't have a blessing for me? Don't you have don't you have anything left over? And you know this this crying out in anguish with this background is very, very extra touching. It's not just a guy who wants a blessing. And it's not somebody who wants who's who's angry that he was cheated out of something that 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 belongs to him. This is his father. He's totally devoted to his father. Can't his father give him a blessing? This is pure heartfelt pain. With all of the essentializing that the Zohar does, with all of the painting Esav into, you know, this flat picture of abstract evil, in the end is an undeniable human dimension. And of course that human dimension is exactly the world that we live in. That's the human dimension. So it's got to count for something. So um, the, the uh, maybe Jacob, I'm gonna say it this way. Maybe Jacob is the Gvar Shlim. Maybe Jacob is the perfect person. But the perfect person is not a human being because human beings are not perfect. So Esau is actually in a certain sense, the more perfect person than Jacob, if we don't allow Jacob to be anything other than pure unadulterated perfection. If we allow Jacob to be a human being, then there'll be imperfections and he will be, you know, uh, uh, um, limping on one of his legs because that's what human beings are. So Esau in that sense, refuses every effort, mighty, mighty efforts, pages and pages of, of the Zohar's very skillful and, and uh, determined work to make him into, you know, the cartoon character of the arch, of the arch uh, enemy, the arch and the, and the arch evil one. He, he is, but guess what? He, he can't, we can't pin him down totally. We can't pin him down totally in that way. And in this world, that counts for something. Any last comments that uh, anybody wants to uh, say this evening? Well, just, uh, Reb, just, you know, if it, we've been reading this whole piece as if, 
you know, Esau, we're seeing him as son, but if we read this whole piece as Esau as essence of evil, it helps us think about that existence a little differently, it feels say, to me. Say more, say more. What do you mean? Because it's, it's if, it, if, it, if this is all Esau as evil, if this is all about evil in our family, in the world, it's as it, it's, it's honoring you, it's a part of you, it belongs there, it's creating a place in its home like it belongs there. It's, it's here, you can't get rid of it. It's a part of our lives, it's a part of existence. So, I mean, it just, it, you could read this as again, a continuation of, of wrestling with this, that piece of evil in our home, because it's, I mean, so welcoming, right? It's such a servant to you. So, you. so before Larry, one more second. I just want to bring up a phrase that uh, became very, very uh, uh, controversial a couple of years ago. There's good people on both sides. How did, does that fit into any of this uh, discussion that we're having? Yeah, Larry. Well, oh, I, before the, the answer to that, but I want to go further to what Seth said. Yeah, and yeah. Not only, not only that, but that this quote evil, I'm putting it in quotes, is part of God. In other words, that Asav is part of God and that it's just a question, it's just, it's just a process, it's just unfolding, and it takes a long time to unfold. And that Gevura or, 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 or Yira, or, you know, like the, this, the left side that, 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 that Yitzhak loved Esau, right? It, it just has to take a long time to merge the two sides, the, the Chesed and the Gevura have to merge into, into, into uh, Tiferet, into, in, into Yaakov, and then it's just, it's just going to take a long time to unfold. It's an arc of, an arc of history bending. I don't know the answer to your question about the uh, good people on both sides, but that's what I, that, 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 and, and to me, this somehow seems to like feed into like Hasidic philosophy, where there seems to be no real evil. There's no, there's no real evil. It's just, distance from God. It's like, it could be very far distant from God, but it's no real, it's not like, you know what I mean? It's nothing, it's not outside of God. Anyway, that's how, that's what I, that's what I take it. From. Yeah, so I don't want to get into what, if that's an accurate description of Hasidic philosophy, since sure. Hasidic philosophy is very diverse and, and uh, variegated, um, and but just on a simple level, for the Zohar, there is real evil. There is real evil. And his name is Asaph. Um, and nevertheless, and nevertheless, we have all this. And of course, in the end, what the Zohar ends with is, and his time will come. You know, his time will come. All of this allowing, you know, for Asaph to have his way with the world will, will end. Right, it's going to take a long time, as you say, but it's not simply peaceful. Right, it's gonna, it's gonna. There's still going to be a struggle. There's still going to be the crushing. It's not just all do. You know, you know, trickling down. Uh, you know, uh, distilling in the atmosphere in this gentle, beautiful, quiet uh, establishing of 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 perfection. It's still going to be tough. All right, we're going to stop here. And uh, we begin, look, we look forward to beginning a new Parsha. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, Zag is into everybody. Oh, oh, thank you. Good night.